thank you very much indeed, and, um, and thank you all of you for giving up. It's a lovely sunny evening to, to join me here this evening. Um, it's always a delight to be, to be in Belfast. I've been here many times, and I always get such a warm welcome from people. It's actually a really great city to be in. Um, what I want to talk about is the book that I've recently published. It's actually a... Well, I retired last September. Well, my wife would question that, but formally I retired last September. And as I was moving towards retiring, I wanted to kind of try to make sense of the field that I've been working in for the last 35 years or so, trying to make sense of what it is I've done, what it is that was valuable about this, the area of the involvement of universities in the field of education. Um, and um, I did a lot of reading, I did a lot of historical research for the first time, understanding where I came from professionally. Um, I did quite a lot of philosophical research, I also did some empirical research as well. I came to talk to some colleagues here um, in, in Belfast and in about 10 different um, departments of education across the UK. Now, bringing that stuff together, constantly asking myself, well, what is it that actually, is, that actually shapes the field that I've given my professional life to? Um, you say my most recent book, I suspect it'll be my last book, well, it may not, who knows. But anyway, um, and this is what I've called it, and that's what I want to talk a bit about tonight. Um, now, to talk about education as a discipline is, is itself quite controversial. But there are two ways of asking um, the question about the discipline. You can ask the question epistemologically or sociologically. If you ask a question epistemologically, you're asking questions about what constitutes a discipline in terms of its, um, what counts as evidence, what theories it uses, what focus of topics it um, addresses. Um, and if you look at education from that point of view, then it's clearly actually not a discipline at all, because it's immensely diverse. We use every single, every single research method theory. We use all sorts of different theoretical frameworks. We use all sorts of different sorts of areas of interest from very early years to lifelong learning. And so it is therefore at that level appropriate to characterise it as a, as a field, a field of study. But there's another way of asking questions about discipline, and that's to ask them sociologically. The extent to which the discipline is established in qualifications, in buildings, in, in, um, in lectureships, in professorships, in, in, in journals, in um, conferences, and of course, from that point of view, it's absolutely clear that education is a very, very um, significant and robust discipline in the university world nowadays. One of the interesting things about asking questions about disciplines from a sociological point of view is you start to see that they are not self-given. They are actually a political project. People argue for them. People push them forward. They get knocked back. They are controversial activities in themselves inside the university world. And actually, I would argue that probably nowhere that, 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 that political process gets illustrated better than the field of education, because it has been an enormous political project that is still very, very much live in terms of its debates about whether education is an appropriate discipline in the field of, in the university today. So I want to highlight that political process by talking about the discipline of education sociologically. Um, I want to ask four anatomical questions. I've only got time to touch on them um, very briefly. But I want to ask very briefly where we come from um, as a discipline. Where are we now? Why are we shaped like we are with all of our strengths and our challenges? And where should we be in the future? The audacious one we need to start to ask ourselves, I think. Another way of putting that is how can we rescue the university project um, that's the subtitle of the book, but I think and it's, it sounds somewhat alarmist, but I think it actually is the challenges that are faced by the field of education as a discipline are very, very severe at the moment, not just in the UK, but in many, many parts of the world. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do. No small feat to do in three quarters of an hour. Um, I'm going to have a go to give you a flavour of some of my arguments. Well, where do we come from? Well, um, I would say there's probably a, 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 you can trace the aspiration for education to be part of the university system for at least about 100 years. And in relation to the education of teachers, there have been two traditions. Um, there is the majority tradition of what we would call the normal colleges. Normal colleges, originally religiously based um, colleges for the education of teachers in England and Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, uh, here you can see the picture of one from... Um, 
from uh, London and Barrow Road College. Um, uh, and they were, this is the, 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 the French notion of normal, which is normal, which means that the, the, the college normal, which has you know, a strong moral position about what it's trying to achieve in these educational processes. Um, that was the dominant tradition for the majority of preparation of teachers. What we get from 1852 is the university system, or the emerging university system there is Owens College in Manchester, starting to play in the field of education. Um, Owens College in Manchester started to offer evening classes for practicing teachers in the 1850s. And what you then get um, is from the 1890s onwards, um, about 20 or 22 of the established universities um, in England and Wales and Northern Ireland starting to develop what were called day training colleges, offering co uh, uh, courses for uh, teachers to become prepared as teachers once they've graduated. Um, uh, in, Cape, in Oxford, we started around 1892, something like that. Queen's established its first professor um, in 1902. The university system was always a very small-scale system, much more the minority system for the preparation of teachers. Um, it was the, the majority system was through the normal colleges, which were um, fairly austere places with a relatively short amount of, of uh, very, uh, direct training. Scotland had a very different tradition. It's always had very, very high prestigious, intellectually rigorous colleges of education that were, saw themselves as different and in many ways equal to the world of the university. They were, didn't see themselves as an inferior institution in any sense at all. Um, what I found interesting in lo looking at the, um, the history of that, of this, this, this world, was that there were two points in, um, in England and Wales um, where there was a serious attempt to bring the normal college tradition into the university world, both of which got scuppered for different reasons. In the 1920s, there was a strong movement um, led by um, the National Union, led by the, um, uh, the um, Labour Party. Um, uh, it was actually in their manifesto in the 1920s, and they wanted to bring the teachers' colleges to the university sector. Um, for better or worse, um, the teachers backed the national strike, and the government were absolutely horrified at the idea of having teacher education and therefore the control of teachers move out into the independent university sector. And that was that movement was then suffered. And we see the same sort of movements in 1947, um, after the war, um, the McNair report was set up to think about the future of teacher education. Now we had secondary school free for everybody. Um, and what they came to the conclusion was um, that it was that, that was a committee that was dominated by the vice chancellors. And although the government were relatively easy about the idea of teacher education moving into the university <laughs> sector fully, um, it was actually the vice chancellors who were actually extremely nervous. And they were nervous about a very applied field getting involved in the loftier forms of knowledge that they were involved with. And they were also very nervous about a field which was very dominated by government control, being brought into the university sector. And therefore, the vice chancellors kicked that into the, the long grass again then. So there's a really, really interesting series of politics about that. And, I've, um, and of course, the politics in, in Northern Ireland, um, for the final resolution of that process, of course, is still going on. <laughs> there's a, another history um, which is to do with research, which is a smaller parallel history. If you look back into the 19th century, um, it's actually in Scotland where you first get the appointments of um, um, professors of education, um, the idea of applying the principles that come out of the Enlightenment into the study of the field of education. Um, and by the time you get into the 1920s, many universities, not just Queen, many universities that we <coughs> had departments of education start to appoint professors for the first time. Right up until the, so after the Second World War, they were nearly all concerned with um, educational test testing, um, IQ measurement, those sorts of things. But there was the beginnings of a science of education from that sort of period of time. So a very interesting and rich and conflicted and co uh, a conflicted history to be told about our field and where it comes from and where we come from, many of us who work in it. It really wasn't until 1963 that things really started to change with the Robbins Report. Because Robbins wasn't just about higher education, Robbins was also about a whole special section on the education of teachers, who advocated that we should move teaching to become a graduate profession. And if we did that, we had to develop a degree level entry, Bachelor of Education, which had itself to be a professional course that was valuable in academic terms. 
And the answer um, uh, been put forward by R.S. Peters and to a lesser extent by Paul Hurst, <coughs> arguing that the way forward to do that was to establish the, social, the, the disciplines of sociology, psychology, philosophy and history. And that would give the backbone to professional education, which would make it degree worthy. And what's interesting about that, if you read the history of that, is that what you actually have is an agreement about a structure of a new degree that was agreed across the whole length and breadth of the UK. Um, in, in Great Britain and Northern Ireland all agreed that this new degree should have this common structure. It's actually almost kind of an unheard of thing nowadays, that anyone can <coughs> do what that would be. Um, but that was the, the power of, of um, Peters' thinking at the time. Um, and so that idea, and actually the, the idea of that's what education ought to be was actually spread much further than inside the UK. You also see a similar structure for education degrees in many parts of the Commonwealth as well. Um, that idea, though, also then simulated a huge flurry of educational research. It burst out from being just, so, just, just being psychologically based. It burst out into being um, into the world of sociology and psychology and philosophy. And it also unleashed a huge demand because there were now people teaching at degree level in the colleges. It pushed a great deal of demand for master's degrees and eventually for doctorate work and all sorts of things. It became a great stimulus for educational research. One of the things that um, Robbins was worried about, though, was that he was arguing that if teachers' colleges are going to teach at degree level, they need to be institu the institutions that got out of the, under the thumb of government that had the control of their own curriculum, that had an institutional autonomy of, them, of themselves. And he wanted to see them integrated into the <coughs> university system with some of the existing universities and into the new universities he imagined that would be formed. Um, and he couldn't, you couldn't, he couldn't have believed, though, that it would take another 40 years for that to take place. And it really wasn't until we get to 1992 that we actually start to see that story really come fully to fruition. Well, actually, you can say again, with the debates that are still going on in Northern Ireland, you can still see the working out of some of his principles from 1963, the final part of putting all the good jigsaw <laughs> together um, uh, in, in making sure that we actually have a full system for education, which actually is, is, is profoundly based in research at institutions. So, um, well, where are we now? Well, we've got 112 departments of education in the UK. Um, you can divide that up in all sorts of different ways. Um, obviously, there's the pre 92 sector, and then there's the post 92 sector, and then there's the University of Ulster, um, which is the only institution that actually crosses those boundaries in terms of its history. It's quite unique from that point of view. Um, in the pre 92 sector, I divide them up um, as rule of thumb in terms of the research elite. That's where the, the departments of education themselves are confident about their research profile. And they are very different if you go and visit them from those that are departments of education in old universities that are research insecure. They feel very different. In the post um, 92 sector, you get the ex polytechnics, um, also of course here in, in, in Ulster, which again have a really, really different feel because they're institutions that are still based strongly in their community and have a strong vocational dimension to them. Um, and then you get, um, uh, in, particularly in, in England, you get the, uh, the new teachers' colleges. Uh, the ex-teachers' colleges have kind of changed themselves over the last 10 years. The most recent ones have become universities. Um, some of them I call the new entrepreneurs, um, really expanding, going to every single course opportunity available, becoming really substantial and diversified institutions in which education was the centre and is now shrinking in terms of the proportion of those, what those institutions are like. And then there are some other um, smaller universities which um, the government characterises as teaching only universities that are, have, they're kind of small liberal arts institutions. And there is research done there, but the government has looked at them as teach, new teaching only universities. Um, and they, they are also quite different. So um, you can cut the cake up in a whole variety of different sorts of ways. But what's interesting is if you do move around these different sectors, you realise how different education becomes as a field, um, as it's instantiated in different sorts of institutions, has different lived realities for the staff and for the students, different understandings of what the enterprise is about. And it was very interesting choosing a sample of 10 institutions around these sorts of characteristics and then going to visit them and comparing them and talking to people about what their curriculum was, what 
how life stories were when there's a star, how life was lived, how the students lived their life um, at, at, in different sorts of institutions. And there are very important differences in the field that we have. This is a bit about the individuals. I can't do much on it, but it's a very, very large social science in the UK. Um, 5,200 academics, um, only a third branch of the last REE. Um, we are older than other social scientists, and that's because um, many of us have dual careers. Um, we've been um, in the teaching field before we come into um, education, universities. Compared with the rest of social science, it's a feminised field, 67% female. It's a very white and British field, which is really, really interesting. Compared with the other social sciences, um, education has not um, become um, more ethnically diverse. It has not become um, more diverse in terms of, of people's nationality as well, which is very interesting. Um, relatively low paid as well, you'd be interested to know. Um, education compared to the rest of social science has a smaller portion of people in the high levels of pay. Very, very important, uh, the last couple of points there. Um, only 30, There's 34% of those 5,000 people um, on teaching only contracts. That's the highest proportion in social science in the UK. And the lowest proportion of staff with doctorates is the highest degree. We might have a debate um, at the end last why these things happen. So what you get is a segmented labour force, really. Um, you've got an established, well-established group of better qualified people who are high, who, some of whom are quite well paid, they're on secure teaching and research contracts. There are still, there were 1,800 in the last RAE. That is still a bigger number than sociology and economics combined. It's as big as psychology. There are a large number of very well qualified, established academics, research academics in the field of education. It's just that that is only a third of the system. There's a lot of people who are not in that, and that's the second part of that segmented group then. A large group of less academic and territorial staff, many on teaching only and insecure contracts. Just a few words about our teaching. This is um, really only about teacher education, this little slide, and there's more to say. But, um, and that's because teacher education, well, until Michael Gove finally gets his hand on him in England, the struggle is in on at the moment, but it's certainly, at the moment, still two-thirds of the student numbers. And it's got lots and lots and lots of strengths. I mean, the, the reports that we get from our inspectorates um, across the UK are very, very positive indeed. There's no question about that. Very positive. And the quality of the students, particularly in Scotland and Northern Ireland, is incredibly strong. Um, and it's strong in a postgraduate level in England as well. And it's strong in England in the four-year degrees. I think there are some questions about student recruitment and the three-year degrees inside England. I would have questions about it. Um, it's also immensely popular with students. If you look at the feedback you get from students as well, some of the, 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 the positive feedback you get looking at them in, in England, the, the, the percentage of you get newly qualified teachers say, how well do you prepare? Um, and you get a, a overwhelmingly positive responses. Something like 96% of students say, Yes, there are questions I've got, but my, 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 my sum is I was very, very, very well prepared, very high quality preparation I've been engaged with. But there are some things on the other side of the, um, of the coin. Um, we've had 25 years of the turn to the practical in teacher education. Um, in England and Wales, in particular, um, <coughs> overwhelming government control, a strong pressure to become more and more instrumental in what we do. I think in Scotland and Northern Ireland, there is still, as Linda was saying, there is still a greater emphasis on theory and reflection, but I still think that pressure has been there to actually make, even, even when there is a space for theory and reflection, to actually um, move in more instrumental um, ways. And this has, I think, this has major implications for the field. Um, because um, if, you're, if, you're, if your courses and the courses that you teach are intended to be largely instrumental, it means that you must then recruit staff directly from school, that they must hold them account for their work within engaged with school work, here and now, in a very, very real sense. That there's influences for who you recruit, the sorts of professional development you make available to them, and the research aspirations that they have, which are, again, around the very practical business of schooling. 
that, so it shapes that, that, that shapes the discipline in very, very profound ways. Um, and in many ways, I think, very good ways. And also, we can argue questions about whether that's sufficient or not. It also has implications because you then develop an institutional culture that feels very different from other disciplines as well. Because it's so bound up, two thirds of its teaching, its staff straight from school. Uh, the professional development is around becoming more and more school relevant and engaged. It served to, to drive a wedge between the, the, this discipline and other disciplines in some ways that sometimes is not always helpful. To a bit about our research, the balance sheet, well, <coughs> there is some astounding work. So it's only good work if you look at the, the report from the last RE panel. Um, very, very complimentary, very, very strong, talking about really excellent work, excellent policy work. Um, a profile that's as good as any of the other social sciences you might want to compare it with in the best institutions, no question about that. And lots of very high profile work internationally. And it's immensely rich. There are over 600 uh, refereed English language education journals in the world. Over 600 of them. It's just, and there are so many conferences, there are so many, there are so many learned societies of interest in education. It's incredibly rich field. Um, and very dynamic in all sorts of ways. But we are nowhere near as successful as we should be in relation to the size. We are the second largest social science after business and administration. Um, how we are getting nowhere near the number of research council grants that we ought to. Um, we recruit people directly from schools, and then we don't always, uh, very largely, don't give the training opportunities to develop the research profile in relation to that. So some of our work is not of the highest quality. Some of our, sometimes we do use other limited methodologies. And we are increasingly different from other disciplines. When I came into this business, um, I would go regularly to sociology um, conferences, and sociologists would come to sociology and education conferences, and many of us would engage in teaching each other's programmes. There is no way in which that is possible today. We live in quite, quite separate worlds, which I think is actually to our detriment. You have to remember that at 1,600 out of 5,000. Um, and we're dominated by applied work with the government as a funder. And that actually is important in, 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 in many ways. Because, for better or worse, um, uh, the government, of course, is now shrinking its funding, which is a problem in terms of maintaining our research profile. But it, um, it is a problem in another way, in that the, uh, if we're dependent on that for much of our research funding, the, the, the peer review process is much weaker when you're applying for government funding than if you're applying for European Union funding or if you're applying for research council funding. And those painful businesses to go through, but my goodness, don't learn how to sharpen your research when you do, when you do go through those things. So having a field which is overwhelmingly about 80% of our research funding coming through government sources actually has a washback effect on the quality of our research in complex ways, I think. So the overall diagnosis then, well, it's a segmented field. Segmented in terms of institutions, staffing, teaching, research. And significantly, I think it's a discipline that's often isolated from other disciplines in many respects. It's not actually in charge of its own destiny. So, why are we here, why are we here then? <coughs> I've got two answers, I've really only sketched these. But I think at the end of the 20th century, two things were starting to happen at the same time as education really arrived at the high, ta high table of the university system from 1992 onwards. Universities were changing in absolutely profound ways, and ways that actually have had an enormous effect on the quality of education. The first is the development of what they call neoliberal higher education policy, where um, education has <coughs> become bound up with. Um, ideas uh, that the, uh, the importance of, of, of increasing the number of students um, in higher education. Um, but there's been not enough money to go around. You know, the, the unit of resources shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk in really, really significant ways. Um, at the same time, as partly as a way of responding to that, um, the government has introduced competitive research assessment. We've had more than 20 years, of, but, um, nearly 30 years of the RE and its different, different versions. Um, we've also had a government's a, a, a way of dealing with that massification. There isn't enough money to go around. They've started to be not convinced that research is even essential for higher education. So the 2004 Act, Education Act, which had 
consequences in 2006 onwards, um, said that you could actually imagine a university that didn't have a research profile. That, in reality, people have carried on doing research, but it's definitely less government policy. And that's a way of them responding to this <coughs> massification in terms of numbers and they're, and they're reducing unit of resource. Another thing that's happened is that research itself has got increasingly tied up with um, international competitiveness for the country as a whole. There's been some really interesting um, things there. There has been more money around. Um, it's shrinking, at, very much shrinking at the moment, but certainly in the 2000s, there's more and more money around for educational research. But there was a kind of a, what you might call a new social contract for it, in that government increasingly became involved in defining the topics and defining the methodologies and increasing accountability with what the research there was. So you've got a number of different pressures on the university system. And the consequence is that chronic underfunding is that you have to become an entrepreneurial university. If you're a vice chancellor, if you're head of the department, and you're not fleet of foot in looking for the next opportunity and responding very sensitively and quickly to what the market wants of you, you will not be successful as an institution. You will not be successful as a faculty. You have to be entrepreneurial in a whole range of different sorts of ways. And that's had hugely important consequences for the field of education. I'll come back to you in a minute. The other thing that happened at the same time as we were arriving in higher education is what for summing up in just one paragraph, and Ron Barnett would call the collapse of Sermon Certainty. Now, this is your postmodernism bit. I'll read it to you though. The idea of objective knowledge is central to higher education, but from various theoretical quarters philosophy of science, sociology of knowledge, epistemology, critical theory, post structuralism the idea of objective knowledge and truth has come under massive assault. Pragmatism, so what if, what if anything is going to replace objective knowledge is unclear. Pragmatism, relativism, metacritic criticism, even anything goes, they're all proposed. The very diversity of the alternative options is testimony to the collapse of some of our basic epistemological tenets. The idea then that the university was a place that had a distinctive body of knowledge that only it professed, it was a place where you could go to for that knowledge. That idea has come under massive assault, and it's particularly problematic in a very applied field like education. And our confidence in that we put something <coughs> distinctive in terms of knowledge that other people simply don't have, that confidence, I think, has been profoundly eroded. So you put those two things together, shrinking of resources, the need to be entrepreneurial, a lack of certainty that we've got something in terms of knowledge that no one else has got. And you have a number of consequences that I think affect the whole of universities. Of course they do, but they've affected education in a very, very important way. It has meant that the government's been able to be increasingly assertive in defining the teaching and the research that it wants to buy. Um, and, that it, uh, and, and it's been increasingly difficult to argue back and say, well, we've got some, we've got some important principles that we must insist on. Um, we, the university has had to follow where the money is, without the confidence to be able to say this is what we've got, no, you need to be able to, um, these are our principles. And so um, it's had two different sorts of consequences. Successful departments have rapidly pursued alternative markets, international students, independent research grants. That gives you money and it gives you independence. You haven't got the government telling you this is how you should define education, this is how you define research, this is what you should teach. No wonder then deans and, and, and vice chancellors pursue these things. It's that that gets them out of this very narrow trap of there, if they're in it. It has a particular effect. Well, that, what that does is increase stratification. It's the Matthew principle. And for those that have, they shall be given more. Um, and then, in particularly in a field like teacher education, where the main funder has been government, um, where it's, it's no, uh, they're in a very, very increasingly strong position to actually dictate what it is they precisely want. I and mean, teacher education, I think, across the UK, um, it's somewhat different <coughs> in Northern Ireland, but it's certainly the case in England and Wales. Um, questions also, I think, in Scotland as well. Teacher education becomes increasingly downgraded as a universal activity. Mm -hmm. It's intensified. There's been that casualisation of staff, the provision of labour that I said you can get from that overall, overall figure. So it's the coming together of that entrepreneurial university in the context of not no longer feeling confident in what it is we've got has had all these um, 
a negative consequence in, in having to become immensely sensitive to what it is our funders want. Um, and education has different universities have some opportunity to stand outside that if they can get independent research grants, if they can get international students. But not all universities can do that. And if we are, we operate in different, different markets. So, I think our crisis is that after 100 years of struggle to get into the university system, we had, I think, what you know, I would call a pillage victory. So we're now overwhelmingly in the university, but too much of our teaching and our research is not of the university, or at least it's not recognised as such. Loads of brilliant things go on inside private classrooms and lecture theatres like this, but they're not necessarily what the government thinks it's paying for, um, I think. So, last bit then, that's from the university project. One of the problems we have, I think, is that um, when you say to people, um, what are you going to do about this fact that the government doesn't seem to believe that you're an important part of the, of the university world, they say, well, we're really good. Um, we meet all the government targets. Um, I hear this in, in youth centre groups, university councils, educating your teachers, I hear that all the time. <coughs> what people very rarely do is articulate the common purpose of anything beyond the utilitarian. They don't say, this is what the university is giving that's distinctive. This is what we've got to offer. This is what we can bring to the party that actually is different from what anybody else could do. Um, and it's, the need, it seems to me that that's one of the things that I think uh, many, many disciplines need to be able to articulate in the very utilitarian <coughs> world that we now live in. But I think it's very, very powerfully important to education. And I don't think that I've necessarily got the answer at all. What I'm trying to do is to stimulate a debate, say, this is the question you've got to address. What it is it that we've got that is distinctive, that we can contribute to the field of education, that others, in collaboration with other people, but what is it that we want that's different? I'm pushed back to start to ask, well, what's a university anyway? Where I begin. And the thing about modern universities is that they're such a muddle of different ideas. Um, if you listen just a little bit carefully, you can still hear in the senior economy, if you have a senior economy, somewhere one of the motoring is very cool, very motor um, But um, you can hear the voice of, of Newman, the idea of liberal education, the idea of, of from Matthew Arnold, universities about teaching the best that's been thought and said in the world and communicating that to the next generation. And that's really what's distinctive and important about the university. And you can still hear those arguments around. And they're still important ideas. A very different sort of idea of the university is that it's a research and specialist research institute where the real heart of it is professors working with their postgraduate students and producing new knowledge. That's not necessarily the same as a liberal education institution. There's another tradition, which goes right back to the medieval university, that universities are about professional education, about engaging with the world, but particularly, I mean, certainly the medieval university, of course, in the field of um, um, theology and, and law, and then much old shortly after into, into medicine. Um, or you can come from a different tradition again, from the civic university tradition, from, from David Hume, particularly an idea that emerges in Scotland, that the university um, is part of engaging with the real world, it's got to be accessible qualifications, it's got to be involved in the local community, in the local economy. Those ideas whisked out of Scotland and got involved in the American education system <coughs> of land grant, land grant universities. But all those voices here, they're all, I bet you they're all in your university, people say that what this place is really about um, is all of these different sorts of things. And in, in the context of that multivocalism, you want to go and say, well, can we then hang on to what it is the university is about? Is there an idea there? Is there still an idea of the university? I think there is, um, but I don't think it's around knowledge anymore. Um, and that's because I think the business about being insecure that there is some form of knowledge you can only get in the university and nowhere else. I think that's been blown out of the water. I think instead, um, a university's central purpose is one I'm using they call the maximization of reason or the contestability of knowledge. There's no, the idea of contesting knowledge, of questioning it, of debating it, of looking for evidence, of challenging it. That goes to the heart of our teaching and it goes to the heart of our research. 
And there are and many other institutions now engage in research, schools engage in research, educational systems engage in research, industry engages in research. But this idea of the contestability of knowledge is not at the heart of what they do. It's not their essential purpose. They're doing this as an addition. And it's, it's, it's about saying that, yes, we, are, we know that any knowledge that we produce um, will be temporary, it will be challenged in five or ten years' time, it will atrophy over time as school systems change, as curriculum change, you know, the world changes in all sorts of ways. But that commitment to testing, to debating, to looking for evidence, to challenging, that is something, it's a process that actually goes to the heart of what the university does. And it makes universities quite unique in society still. Really, really unique in society. And Leslie, you're, if all of those of you who work in the university are incredibly privileged to work in an institution with that as its core value. In recent years, a number of people, particularly Martha Lasper, um, but also Stephen Pellini and others, have argued, argued that we've got to protect the humanities because the humanities are where these values sit most importantly, um, and uh, uh, you know, we've got to protect humanities from the um, utilitarianization of the higher of the university world. If we don't do that, we'll lose something in our civilization. Now, I think the humanities should be protected. But what we have to do in education, we have to win the argument that a discipline, <coughs> an applied discipline like ours, still needs the maximization of reason. It still needs an idea of contesting knowledge. It still needs to have that as what it's about as well. It isn't just that you can have the humanities protected with everyone debating everything, and then you've got everybody else taking it on with the business of being fast and utilitarian and not ask hard questions. We have to win the argument that it's just as important in a vocational field like education as it is in the humanities. Um, it's just as important in applied research as it is in pure research. But those are hardly arguments to win, but they're the arguments that we do have to win. Okay, three points then. This idea then we ought to be retooling our discipline. Um, and there's not a complete list at all. But I'm talking about three retooling for professional education, retooling for knowledge mobilization, and retooling for research. Professional education, I still think it's an important part of what we do and is going to remain so. It may change in its form, particularly in England. <coughs> Initial teacher education is in the process of shrinking quite substantially, <coughs> might even disappear from the university sector for all I know. But I think professional education of different sorts will still be a very important part of what we do. Um, and we need clear arguments, though, about what the contribution of the university is to professional education. A whole range of different people have tried to capture that. Eric Hoyle talked about extended professionality. Um, Cochrane Smith talks about expanded professionalism. Paul Hurst talked about or borrowing from Matthew Arnold, he says, talk about being exposed to the best that's been thought and said in education. Um, he talks about the development of practical theories. There's, it, there's a whole range of different ways in which you can think about what university their contribution is in our field. But I think, however you characterise it, I think what's important to recognise is that it's not just our contribution, it's not just intellectual. When you get people to reflect on their practice, or, on, or, or, or to look at evidence, to um, assess what they're doing, to bring it into critical review. They're doing more than just intellectual things. They're doing what Aristotle would call phronesis. They're starting to develop practical wisdom. Because practical wisdom involves the ability to, has a moral dimension to it. And I think professional education has a strong moral dimension to it. It involves the ability to reflect and achieve good ends that were designed by the community, in this case, um, the teaching community. <coughs> So it goes much further than other sorts of higher education. I think that's why it's so particularly difficult to do in professional education. Because you're not just giving people ideas, you're actually changing them as people, and there is a moral dimension to the world that you're engaging with them too. So those are quite different things. It's not just education, it's all sorts of professional education is involved in these sorts of things. And you're doing more than intellectual work. You are changing people, and you're introducing them to a moral community. But I think you're going to have to ask two questions. Why do teachers need this practical wisdom? Um, I think you can argue from the university's point of view, I think it's unlikely to be persuasive. For me, the more persuasive argument is that 
kids in the world that they're entering, they're entering such a complex world in terms of rapidly changing technology, exploding knowledge, huge mobility in terms of society and values, that they've got themselves, whatever Michael Gove says, they have to have an education that makes them think, that makes them think critically about what they're being told, that makes them understand differences in values, <coughs> that helps them recognise differences in interpretation in interpretations. They've got to develop the skills to make their own judgment in this immensely complex and mobile world that we live in. That's what the kids need. And if the kids need that, then my goodness, we have to win the argument. And of course then the teachers have to have those sorts of values in their professional education in a very, very important Do universities need to be involved in that? Well, I think that schools are absolutely essential contributors. School, universities cannot do this stuff on their own, and I would have arguments with you about the degree um, in which your current system here in Northern Ireland engages systematically and sustained and effective ways in professional education with their schools. Um, <coughs> but the universities themselves, though, do have something to bring to the table, something that is distinctive. There are repositories of a wide range of examples, the best that's been thought and said in education, and they have at their core this principle of the maximization of learning. They have at their core this mission idea of accessibility of knowledge. And that's what they can bring to professional education as distinctive. And that's a key part in developing this public school system. But it is practical, it does also mean strongly engaging in the real world. Is how you bring those two things together. I think, I'm not sure how effective we are in doing that at the moment. You know, we have we got the right institutional structures to do that, um, to develop what I, you might call a kind of research informed clinical practice. What I do know is that there's dreadful figures about casualising part time staff. Every time you casualise staff who are in the front line of professional education, you undermine our very claim to have something distinctive to offer. You're cutting them off says you're part of the scholarly culture and that's what you're bringing to the table. You're undermining that every time you do that. Okay, retooling for knowledge mobilisation. We spend an awful lot of money in this country in educational research, about 80 million quid a year. Um, it's shrinking at the moment, but it's still an awful lot of it. And the dominant rationale, if you go to an uh, educational conference, people actually see themselves as working on the five here. They want to make a difference. They really want to make a difference. But impact of what we do as researchers is really, really hard to show. And therefore, governments have all sorts of questions about whether we're worth <coughs> spending money on. We also highly apply, and many universities are quite snooty about highly applied research. They much spend their time, or spend their time doing loftier and high power sorts of things. So you get caught in, in from both directions, really. Um, I think we have to win the argument. We can't just wait for 25 years for ideas to this concept of knowledge creep, um, who's a sociologist of knowledge who may have forgotten at the moment, coined this phrase, Carol Weiss, Carol Weiss. And she says it takes 25 years for ideas out of the universities to change the question. <coughs> and that's what you do. You change the question. You don't necessarily give the answer, but it becomes common sense that you should look at this in a different sort of world. We haven't got 25 years. We haven't got 25 years. People like Michael Gibbons, David Ard Hardwin and others, they're arguing that actually institutions don't need universities anymore. They, should, they need to get on and produce the knowledge themselves. Schools need to do this. Local authorities need to do this. Industry needs to get on and produce the knowledge itself. And, that, and the shift, there's a big shift in government policy and European Union policy as well. And actually see knowledge production happening out there, not in places like this. So if we want to hang on to research, we've got to be much better at mobilising what it is we have to seems to me. Much better than we are. I think we're too often too complacent. We have conferences. We think we've done what's needed. And for a discipline that largely justifies itself to itself as being applied, it simply is not enough it seems to me. There's no simple answer. Um, we have to think much more about action research. And there's a strong tradition in the UK that we need in, in education where we need to think in these um, developing further. We need to think much more about how you get um, <coughs> practitioners involved in designing research questions, in thinking through the research from the very beginning. We had a big initiative funded by the ESRC um, that finished seven or eight years ago, the Teaching and 
the research program, in which we learned a huge amount about how you would build people in to asking the right research questions in the first place, how you would engage with communities. We need to be much more savvy about working with knowledge brokers. Now, we're, I'm really nervous about think tanks, but actually it's think tanks that policy makers listen to, not academic researchers. They're with them routinely. You look at the net networks and connections. We need to be working with people like the think tanks who actually have those connections in a way that we find really hard to do. And I think we also have to think about whether we've got the structures right. I put up the future lab. Just an example, a really interesting um, example of an institution built in Bristol. Um, it's now um, gone, um, or virtually gone. But it was an interesting initiative because it tried to break the boundaries. It was an institution doing fundamental research on new technologies and learning, funded um, by the government, funded by the new technologies industry, very close to Bristol University, but not part of it. So it, it went across all these boundaries. And it was able to do things, really serious research, very respectable academic research, but it broke boundaries that, that, that would be very, very hard for universities to do. I'm not saying they got the answer right, but it was an interesting experiment. But I don't know whether we've got any of our structures right in terms of being able to engage with industry, to be engaged with government, to engage with profession. It's a hard question, I think, for us there. Final one, very final, honestly. Return for research. We've got to continue getting better at our research and education. Uh, we have a broad-based range of methods. We're still incredibly weak in quantitative methodologies. And that is the, the research discourse of the day. And if we're not uh, able to articulate, clearly, to engage clearly with that, we are constantly marginalised. We've got to open up our research to other disciplines. As I said I, my senses of our disciplines are becoming increasingly um, closed and um, away from other disciplines. We've also got to broaden our research agenda. Um, there are educational questions around all of that lot. And what is important to note for us, and salutary to note for us, if you were government and wanting to form or renew a research team looking at the impact, the educational, the, the impact of social um, of ageing on the community, and there will be ed education as well as the medical uh, questions around there. If you are funding research, would they be turning to education departments to contribute to an interdisciplinary project like that? The chances are not, it would seem to me. The, 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 all of these different sorts of questions are interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary questions. And increasingly, the European Union in particular, and driving the UK government, are pushing towards more interdisciplinary questions. And if we are not able to get ourselves engaged in those debates, because anyone can do the education bit, then that's going to be a hugely lost opportunity for us. Um, but we are very narrow in the sorts of things that we think we're experts at. So it's a, just as I said before, but I said the research agenda is changing, I think. Um, and certainly impact is not going to be in the But we do have to think hard about interdisciplinarity. And we've got to demonstrate that we can contribute to these changing national and international debates. Finally, I think we have to recognise and face up to the fact that doing research is actually central to what I try to define as the university project. Only if faculties of education themselves develop strong, inclusive research cultures can you ensure that that principle of the maximisation of reason stays at the core of your faculty as well as your university. When teaching by core staff is undertaken by staff who become casualised, who are excluded, it undermines the very legitimacy of saying we have something distinctive to offer. So research is not just important in itself, it's about how you actually maintain what it is that's distinctive about the university. It's the bread and butter that actually makes the thing work in the first place. And I think every, by chance, that every dean of education needs to take that message on board very seriously. The real university, this is um, Robert Persick, a philosopher and social commentator, so the real university is a state of mind. It's that great heritage of rational thought that's been brought down to us through centuries, which doesn't exist in a specific location. It's a state of mind which is regenerated throughout the centuries by a body of people who traditionally carry the title of lecturer or professor. But even that title is not part of the real university. The real university is nothing less than the continuing body of reason itself. 